Hello and welcome to the podcast. So I think today is the official day that I'm streaming live on Facebook. I think I figured out the glitch last time. I thought I was streaming live and it went uh, private and only my eyes could see it. So that's not much of a live stream. Yeah, but yeah. if you are seeing it uh, today, I, I have it pulled up here on the screen. I think, um, you know, it maybe drop questions or comments in there and, and we can answer them. Uh, why we do this again. I'm, I'm not sure this is our first time, so we'll just we'll just see how this this goes. So on today's episode, I have Dr. Ariane Missimer. I found Dr. Missimer through a course I saw her teach on the vagus nerve for Rupa Health. Uh, Rupa Health is a very large platform for you that don't know that provides um, very complex lab testing, I would say, or gives access to lab testing for um, even the general public if they want to go uh, kind of be their own advocate for their health. Uh, this Rupa Health platform um, is fantastic. So I found her on there. She owns a functional medicine and physical therapy clinic in Pennsylvania. Her approach to medicine is through whole body wellness. She is also a cancer survivor. So I feel like we're going to have a lot of interesting things to talk about. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I like your background. Uh, Thank the you. Mindset, nutrition, <laughs> and movement there. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> three very important pillars that we'll get to talking about. But so after I invited you on the show and you said yes, um, I was excited and I did a little bit more research and I found a TEDx talk that you had done. And in that TEDx talk, uh, you talked about your own cancer journey, but also uh, your brother's journey with cancer and your mother's journey with cancer. And it was your brother's journey with cancer that kind of got you just thinking about movement uh, a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So I would like for you to tell us a little bit about that journey. Absolutely. So my brother passed away when I was about 21 and he had suffered from Hodgkin's disease and then lung cancer that ultimately took his life. And during that time, I wasn't a physical therapist yet, but I became his physical therapist and I was watching him day in and day out fight for his life and for his health and for his movement. And I realized at that point how many of us take all of that for granted. And I, it really was the saddest day of my life. It was the hardest thing I've ever experienced by far, even my, with my own journey. But I did realize that he gave me the greatest gift, which was my purpose and to help people really take ownership of their health and never take their health for granted. And while my brother was going through cancer, my mom also was diagnosed as well. So the two people that were closest to me fighting for their lives. So it was definitely a life changing experience, but. I really spent my whole career since then in learning everything I possibly can about the human body, starting with more of the physical aspects in terms of movement and rehabilitation, going back to school for my doctorate in physical therapy, but then, and then of course nutrition, but then really moving into the nervous system aspect and mindset and the mental and emotional health more so after I experienced cancer myself. So how old was your brother when he was diagnosed and how long was his journey with it? So he initially had it when he was 11 years old oh. and then he relapsed about 10 years later and had it for, it was about five years where it was Hodgkin's and lung cancer, lung cancer that spread to the brain. When he was so, diagnosed at 11, did he have, like, was he able to have a normal childhood at some point or did he, was it always kind of, you know, up and down? It was a little disrupted. I mean, he lived in at John Hopkins in Baltimore. He had to get a bone marrow transplant. He had to go through chemo multiple times. So as normal as he could be for, you know, f with considering the circumstances. And what kind of cancer did your mom have? She had breast cancer. Okay. Did she survive? She is good. Yes. Okay. And she is my best friend. Okay, <laughs> we travel good. together every year. <laughs> okay, good. I love yeah, that. Doing... Yes. Okay. And um, what about your own cancer journey? Because that's very uh, interesting. And you go on uh, to compete uh, in the Ninja Warrior uh, TV series while, while going through your treatment, which is absolutely incredible. So tell <laughs> us about your journey. Sure. So I was diagnosed two months before my wedding and I, it was really, I have to say the wow. happiest time of my life. So it wasn't, it, you know, I wasn't stressed about the wedding. I, I was, it was just normal. Things were great. And I felt this pinpoint nerve pain in my calf. And so every time I was sitting down, I would notice it. I had my, all my colleagues look at it and no one really had any sense of what it was. And then I finally felt this pretty huge lump be above my knee. 
And immediately I called a local uh, sports ortho sports medicine orthopedic that I was working with. And I said, you know, hey, Dr. Smith, would you mind checking this out? And as soon as I did, he said, you need to see it. You need to get an MRI and you need to get to see an orthopedic oncologist. And it was fast forward from there. So it was I was ultimately diagnosed with stage three liposarcoma, which is there's only 12,000 cases of sarcoma a year. And there's only 50 there's 50 different types and 12,000 cases a year. So it's extremely rare. And it was already at that point, 12 centimeters. So uh, before I had to start chemo before my wedding, I had to I switched to proton therapy. I switched, had to go back to chemo. I did limb sparing surgery. But through that, as you mentioned, I decided why not to train for American Ninja Warrior. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> as most that's people a, would do. That's incredible. Yeah. And I've always been movement has helped heal me, I believe, through just about every life challenge that I've experienced. Yeah. And that was no different. It was not so much about what I was training for, but it was the the irony of me overcoming obstacles. Every time I went to the gym, I'd go to radiation and then I'd come home and train for two hours yeah. and do these obstacles. And it was amazing. And so at the end of it, on my last day of chemotherapy, I submitted my video, my application video. And then four months later, I competed on season wow. eight. That's and incredible. had my port in my chest and <laughs> wow i'm going to have to go back and watch watch that episode i mean that mindset is incredible i mean very very few people um, can have that mindset you know a lot i think might might want to try uh, to have that mindset but when you're in the journey it, it, i think it feels easy to get beat down you know i had a we had just recently lost a friend uh, so to sorry. sarcoma uh, uh, oh my goodness a kidney it was it was on his kidney but um you know he kind of had a similar mindset like walking in um you know and trying to cheer people up that are going through the chemotherapy and like it's in your it's your mindset let's go let's but you know over years and years of that and and watching people get sicker and sicker uh, you know it, it becomes hard it can wear you wear you down as an individual and as a caretaker uh, if it's somebody taking care of you so not many people can have uh, sustain that that mindset through that whole entire journey. So that's that's absolutely and, incredible. And I think to speak to that, I think everyone's journey is so unique and there isn't a right way or a wrong way or a good mindset or a bad mindset, I think, because no one could ever appreciate it until you're in those shoes. Yeah. And so that was my experience and that's what helped me get me through. But I would never say to somebody, go train for American yeah. Warrior, per se. I think it's just you have to honor what it, what you need at that time. And, and that could look very different for each person. But I think my experience with my brother specifically really led into that is that I didn't want to just survive cancer. I really wanted to thrive. And I did. And I, and I think I'm such a better person for it now, although I had a lot yeah. of challenges afterwards. But I think, you know, it's it definitely led into a more fulfilling and Purposeful life. Yeah. You know, and it's a powerful message for everybody, um, regardless if you're going through, you know, cancer or just anything in your life. Like we always said yeah. this about the individual that, um, you know, we unfortunately lost. Like he never complained. And we're over here bitching about the smallest things, you know, on, right. on a day to day basis. And you watch him going through this and so sick and never complaining and just always having the mindset of, you know, positivity and getting through it and being there for a family. So it's just like, right. you know, a lesson for everybody. Um, Right. You know, to, to, to learn from, I feel like. So you said you had, was it attached to your bone? I don't know enough it about was, that. It was attached. No, that's okay. So it was a liposarcoma. So it was attached to my sciatic nerve and my hamstring. So they did have to take quite a bit of my hamstring out. Okay. But the, fortunately, I did not lose my leg, which which was definitely a possibility during the surgery. So the only symptom that you had was just that pain, a little bit of pain. pain. <laughs> Little, little, pin, almost if someone was just pricking you with a little, little needle, just, wow. just a one little spot. That's and, it. And you were obviously very active even back then. So nothing Super in your active. workout routines and mm -hmm. just did Wow. Yeah. And that's what's so fascinating, I think, with sarcoma is you would never know until the tumor is big and it's pressing on something. Yeah. And that's what's, you know, definitely a hard thing to wrap your head around because, yeah you have to get scans to know if something's wrong. You're not going to notice if, if something is just popping up a little, you know, you feel sick or something like that. And I'm, I've always been super in tune with my body. So I always feel like that was a gift because otherwise yeah. I don't think most people would have known. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. Uh, what a, what an incredible story. So um, you, we, we talked about this, the mindset, nutrition, and movement right behind you. Mm-hmm. So those are the three pillars that you approach somebody's um, overall health and wellness with. I would like to just talk about uh, each of those pillars and, and why why they're the pillars of your clinic. And I guess let's just start with mindset because yeah. that's the one I can see behind you. <laughs> yeah. So with mindset, it was a perfect segue, I mean, because I think that I love talking about resilience and that once again can look extremely different for each person. But I think that just like your friend, which I'm so sad that you lost, and when you have that mindset of I can do this no matter what, no matter what challenges are coming my way, you're going to figure out how to navigate that path. And so whenever I have patients that are coming in with really complex issues and multiple issues and they feel like the wheels are coming off and they have no idea where to start, I normally start with giving them a mindset of hope that they can be resilient and that they have this innate capacity to heal. And once someone believes in their own body that they can do this, then everything changes because the nervous system is really what rolls everything right as we know and and that mental emotional spiritual so i i don't like to always think of mindset as just have a positive mindset and everything will be fine because that's not always true either but being able to bring someone into a state of social engagement and connection and groundedness and again that belief in their body to trust that then the rest is easy. The, yeah. Like actually doing the work is easy. Yeah. You know, one of the doctors that's involved in uh, in the Victory Men's Health, uh, he's, he's an orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon, but he was hit by a drunk driver when he was 10 years old and lost his right leg. I think it's uh, his right. Yeah. It's his right left leg. And talk about the power of the mind, you know, that happening that young and, in, and versus going on disability his whole entire life. He stood up. And he became an orthopedic surgeon, went to Notre Dame. I mean, when you look at the power of the mind, because there's very, very few people that that would turn that situation into an opportunity. And it was through, his, you know, that life saving experience that he had with his orthopedic surgeon. That's why he decided to become that. So it's just the power of the mind is just absolutely incredible. And it, it's also like if we're thinking of meditation and you, o- I always say you always have this choice about where to direct your attention and you might have to train that. But when you have, when you know that you have that freedom to say, I'm going to focus on what I can control versus yeah. what I can't control. And yeah. I know not everybody believes in that, but that's been something personally that has been extremely helpful when things just feel like they're totally out of control and out of you know, yeah. any, they're unexpected, they're unpredictable, then it, it's like, okay, well, I know I can focus on my mindset, my nutrition and my movement. Yeah. <laughs> Those okay. are the things that I've got. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm a big believer in the mindset. You can't see it, but this whole right wall of mine is lined with vision boards. Uh, because Amazing. I just like the power of the mind and what you, what you put your energy on and what you put your focus on, um, it does become your reality. So, and you have Absolutely. to, you have to, you know, you have to want it and you have to put it out there for it to come to you. So, um, mm-hmm. so yes, I, I, the power of the mind, uh, I'm a, I'm a believer. So that next pillar that you have there is nutrition. Mm -hmm. So nutrition, I always like to come at this from not necessarily getting rid of all the bad things, but actually trying to optimize our nutrition and think of nutrient repletion. So I definitely believe food is medicine. I recognize, of course, working with a lot of health conditions that sometimes we need therapeutic food plans and sometimes we need to eliminate things. But so often we forget about actually eating good quality whole food and the power of that. And I think there's been so much misconception with nutrition and just especially with social media. And there's just so much misinformation that it's made it so complicated, which I don't want to say that it's easy for people. But at the same time, if we focused on just good whole food and not all of the fad diets and not all all the elimination, yeah. elimination, elimination, we could actually really change our overall health. Um, yeah, because so, if you tell me I can't have something, that's all of a sudden all I can think about. But, but you know, it's like, right. don't tell me that I can't have it because that's all I will think right. about. So it has to be, we have to focus on what I do like. And I think that's yeah. the most case with people or patients or clients, whatever we want to call them, uh, focusing on what they're doing right and, and implementing more yeah. of that than trying to take something away from them because they seem to resist that or, or want to gravitate even more towards it. 
Yeah. And most of the time they're eating so much of that because they're not getting enough of the nutrients that they need. And I, I love using visuals of, you know, if someone's experiencing anxiety or depression and going through why they need their amino acids to be able to produce serotonin and dopamine and GABA to decrease feelings of fear and anxiety, just to help people understand the power yeah. of what nutrients actually do for our health or longevity or performance. And, and I think when people appreciate that, then they're, it's like a whole new world. I'm yeah. Like, oh, wow. Yes. I am going to have berries for my lunch instead of having two pieces of bread <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. this is going to give me so much more and, and you know, then I'm not craving more and more processed foods. Yeah. No, I think that's a great approach. Um, having them realize the power of the food and how it can help their body and in overall health. So uh, the last one there you have is movement. Yeah, and here so. we here we sit at our desk right now. So <laughs> tell me about it. So I am obsessed with movement on so many levels, and I don't necessarily mean just exercise, but actually just moving our body. I think that we, of course, have become such a sedentary society overall, and we have less and less movement variability. And that could just be assuming different postures during the day and changing positions. We're just sitting at a desk yeah. all day long, right? I know we're sitting right now. Yeah. but we were we, well, we aren't sitting all day long and the other thing is is that going back to referencing my brother again is that you know we don't we don't we we take it for granted every day and so as soon as something happens we get hurt we have a tragic event we lose a limb then all of a sudden we we realize the power of movement yes. and that's what i just i my, my goal is to to really truly not let anybody ever take it for granted and just realize that they you need to move your body every day in some some positive way i of course am I could get very specific about that, but generally speaking, I, I think it's one of the most powerful things to do for our mental and emotional health, especially as it relates to interoception, that internal awareness of self. So I love to incorporate a lot of somatics and nervous system regulation through the body in addition to you know, the whole spectrum of getting people to strength train. Yeah. That's one of my, my biggest joys in life is to get people to start walking and then start moving and then strength training and then maybe even a little cardio yeah. <laughs> and actually just feeling good and balanced yeah. and resilient yeah. ultimately. And looking at a workout as I get to, not so I have to. You know, yes. I think when you slow down and look at it, you know, through that perspective, you're like, wow, there's so many people that, you know, don't have this, you know, opportunity. This weekend at my son's baseball game, I tried to walk the park or would, wherever we're at. Yeah. So I'm not sitting there for an hour during warm ups. And it was so hot, but I'm, I'm walking down the, the field. They don't have a they didn't have a great walking path. So I'm just kind of walking the uh, the, the fence there and yep. uh, in wheeled a guy on a wheelchair. And like it, I just had that moment like where I looked at him like. He would like give anything to be probably totally. walking over here in the sun right. next to next to this this fence why he's you know over on the concrete on his wheelchair so it's just i just had like one of those moments like how lucky am i to be you know walking so. which is such an amazing perspective and i think i remember just the other day having this conversation with a patient where i was trying to you know, egg her along and just kind of say, you know, hey, let's just try to, let's just start counting your steps. And even that was so overwhelming to her. And she said, well, I don't have a step counter. And I said, don't worry about a step counter. Just let's just try some other strategies. Let's just try to get some more steps in. And she kept getting more and more stressed about it and saying how she couldn't, she couldn't, she couldn't. And I said, but that's where the mindset piece comes in is that you can and you have the ability and this is such a gift. Yep. And I, you know, I said, maybe just thinking of cherishing that ability to move and to walk so that hopefully you can always do it. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to find opportunities to do it. Like you and I are both busy owning clinics, running around, you know, trying to do the best that we can. So it's like I try to be intentional about my movement. I have a little band here. So I, I was, you know, working on our podcast and I, I'm doing my band or I take a phone call. Yeah. I try to get up and walk, you know, why I'm taking mm -hmm. that phone call versus versus sit. Just try to make little adjustments in your day. I, you know, it's it's not always easy for me to get between ten and 15,000 steps. I'm, I would be yeah, lying to you if I said, said that it was easy for me, but I have to right. be very, very intentional about um, it throughout the day. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think it, it definitely takes effort. I, I, my goal is always between eight to 10,000, you know, and, and I'm super active otherwise, but that's kind of my realistic goal. But sometimes I get 10, but you're working for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you are if seeing patients and things like that. And I always say you have to build it in versus try to fit it in. Yeah. So let's speak, let's talk about something that flares up on me if I don't walk, uh, sciatic nerve, which I'm assuming uh, you have a lot of experience with. So um, what are some tips, tricks, suggestions, or maybe talk to us a little bit about the sciatic and a little education here yeah, <laughs> on, on why this happens? Of course. So the sciatic nerve is a lot of times people say that they have sciatica, but they don't necessarily have the sciatica. It may be a different nerve path. So the sciatica does run from in the back of the leg coming from the L5-S1 nerve root. It kind of goes down like middle of your butt and then back down the leg, and then it does split at the lower leg. And so... When you have sciatica, it could be very different reasons for each person. So I'll give a couple examples. Perfect. For one person, it may be that they don't have adequate what we would call reflexive stability. So that could be the diaphragm, communicating with the pelvic floor, with the deep hip stabilizers. And, you know, it's causing some like poor stability and sequencing around the spine and pelvis. For another person, it could be that they're really stiff in their hips and then their spine is a little bit more unstable because they're, you're getting extra movement there. Sometimes it could be have nothing to do with that at all. And it could just be how someone is transferring force throughout the body, that it might be asymmetrical, it might be a little bit more on one side than the other. That could be related to a foot injury or a shoulder injury. So there's a lot of different reasons, which is why it's hard to say, okay, there's this kind of this is what you do and this is yeah. what you don't do. As an easy suggestion, it is you do want to try to figure out where do you have the pain and what's provoking it. So for example, if you bend forward and you provoke the pain, then you know that flexion or forward bending motions might be more aggravating. So something like sitting would probably be very aggravating. If you bend backwards and you're like, oh, cool, this feels good, then things like walking and standing and even back bending on the floor will likely be helpful for you. Okay. What about rolling it out? Because I think some people have the tendency to like, I'm to put a ball there or a foam roller and and try to, you know, roll not, something out. Not going to roll it out. Yeah. <laughs> unless, I, I will say this, unless you are getting some compression at the level at where the piriformis is, so the sciatic nerve is right behind that. So sometimes someone might have poor hip stability, piriformis gets really tight, and then the sciatic nerve can get a little irritated. So in that situation, temporarily doing a little bit of release right at that spot at the piriformis can be helpful, but only if you stabilize afterwards. So if you what just about keep it? rolling, it will not. Okay. What about if you feel the pain when you get out of bed? Like that first thing in the morning, like it's really difficult to, to get out of bed. We had a patient saying this the other day, like they would say how to crawl out of bed, like, oh, not that way, not that way. <laughs> no. And he, he was like, this way I can finally get up. So in that situation, what I'd have somebody do, kind of take their time getting up or even just doing it on the bed, actually, and rolling onto their stomach. So they're they're just basically just lying on their stomach, doing some crocodile breathing. So you're kind of breathing into the mattress or the floor. So that would be a relative extension position. Then kind of if that felt okay, potentially propping up to the forearms that felt okay, potentially doing some like little press ups, which just helps to decompress the spine. And that's typically the person that has that sciatica when they first wake up in the morning. It's normally that will most for most people be helpful. Okay, not the cure all. Okay, but it would be like sim good symptom management. Yeah. So I know you have a lot of experience with gut health. And uh, one of the challenges that we have in the clinic are there's a lot of patients on PPIs. Um, these uh, acid reflux medications for those of you that are curious what a PPI is. So how are how are you addressing those patients or what kind of tips are you giving them um, uh, to, to prevent that from happening? Because it's so and, and also explain why it's so important that we're not taking these and kind of what it does uh, to that gut brain connection. 
Of course. So, so the, the thing with when anybody is either on them or considering them, I would say the first step is trying to figure out what their symptoms are and why they're having the symptoms. And so often, I don't want to say this, obviously this isn't a blanket statement, but so often it's a very specific reason why they're having, let's say, reflux or any upper GI symptoms to begin with, burping. Many times it could be something like H. pylori that's present in 50% of the population. It's a gram-negative bacteria. It's very transmissible. It's just common. So I see that so, well, one in two people. <laughs> so then, um, but then we can also have food sensitivities, food intolerances, food allergies, and people have no idea what those things might be because they've been eating them for so long. Uh, there could be, of course, gut dysbiosis. There could be other pathogen pathogenic infections. There's typically always a reason. And and so where it depends where someone is on their journey, but what we're trying to do is just figure out what that reason is. So if we figure that out, then we can safely wean someone from a PPI. For example, I had a patient just recently who was put on PPI and, uh, well, two PPIs and just was so bad. Her symptoms were so bad. I finally did a stool test and she had so many things going on. She had a pathogen. She had H. pylori. She had severe leaky gut, low immune system of her gut. And so now we're able to like get her off of the PPIs, get her gut working the way that's supposed to, manage her nutrition, and she's feeling so much better. So good. Uh, I was, I want you to explain the gut brain connection and how important it is. Cause I think yeah. people just gloss over, oh, and I had a little reflex, no big deal or, you know, but, but the pH of the gut is or so our, important our to our overall. health. So, yeah. So I, I like to kind of look at it in terms of pathways. So this can get super complicated, but I'm just going to try to keep it really simple. So think it's four primary pathways of the gut brain axis and they're constantly communicating with each other. So it's not so much just top down or bottom up, but it's really ever evolving. So they're constantly communicating with each other. So if we're thinking of the neural component, which would be one of the pathways, we would want to think about them and I can dive into these more as needed, but one would be the connection of the vagus nerve, which is stemming from the brainstem all the way into the ear, the throat, the esophagus, the stomach, and the entire digestive tract. Then we also have the um, the nervous system. So the enteric nervous system itself is really can think of it like it can function on its own in the sense that it can create its own gut movement. It has what's called the migrating motor complex, which helps to move bacteria through the small intestine to the large intestine. Then we have the second pathway, which is the neuroendocrine. And so if we think top down, we have, let's say we're really stressed and we, which is fairly common, right? Yeah. <laughs> Among everyone. Yeah. So if we have a lot of cortisol that's being produced, then that is going to change our bacterial composition. But we also have all of this, these hormones signaling that's happening to our brain all of the time. Uh, and that is, can affect satiety or, you know, our sense of fullness or sense of hunger and then we have our third pathway, which is the immune pathway. And so that can be related to, if we kind of think 70% of our immune system is our gut. And if we're thinking of our lymph system, that's like one of the biggest things, what we, why we want to try to optimize our lymph and our filtration system. And then the last pathway would be the microbiota neuroactive compounds. And that is things like our serotonin, our dopamine, our GABA. And our gut is actually producing so much of this that's actually contributing to our whole our levels, our neurotransmitter levels in our brain as well. Okay, um, and it's really important to have um, not have a leaky gut. Uh, with it, it's also tied into Alzheimer's. Can you maybe touch yes. on um, on why that's the case and uh, some of your clinical experience there? Yeah. So with leaky gut, which I see in honestly, almost all of my stool tests that I do. So wow. almost every patient I, I see and, and measuring that by zonulin specifically, which is the, the pro not for you, but just for anyone yeah. listening, which is the, the protein that is holding those tight junctions together in the gut. That's, that's really that selective creating that selective barrier. So when, when we see that we can have any type of systemic inflammation because 
anything that's getting into the bloodstream, like pathogens or toxins or undigested food, the immune system is reacting to that, increasing cytokines, and then that can create any type of autoimmune or neurodegenerative or chronic disease. So Alzheimer's being one of many, but I see so many people that are experiencing all these different autoimmune diseases might not have digestive issues, but I'll say, hey, we really need to do a stool test. And sure enough, there's always a correlation with them having leaky gut too. So yes, so I see that quite a bit. I don't, I haven't, I can't say I've seen a ton of people with Alzheimer's. Do see a lot of people with neurodegenerative and overall autoimmune disease. This is a rare one, but I'm curious if you have any experience with it, because I have a friend that's uh, dealing with this right now, uh, CIDP, which is a chronic inflammatory uh, disorder uh, that results in like motor and sensory impairment. Do you have, have you treated anybody with that? I okay. have not. I, I might be working with someone that has that, but I, we haven't connected just yet. She kind of okay. just reached out to me loosely. I really need to find somebody that knows about that because I want to be able to help him. Uh, so if you can, you know, okay, if, yeah, if you, absolutely. If you uh, have any um, suggestions there, okay. uh, please uh, keep me in mind there because it's kind of hard to... Uh, you know, he's he's seeing somebody up at the Mayo Clinic right now, but they're also kind of looking okay. for like what's what's a more functional medicine approach to right. treating treating this uh, right um, disease. So, OK, I also want to ask about the gallbladder, um, you know, that regularly gets taken out and uh, people kind of think oh, it was no big deal. Did I really even need that? But I think it is kind of a big deal to lose your gallbladder. Do you do how do you handle patients that don't have one? Yeah. So typically, I, I there's actually a lot of ways to look at that because one is just the visceral component in general in terms of the organ mobility and motility that's happening around it because everything has to reorganize fascially based on now there's something that was there that's not there. Yeah. So that often can in and of itself create a little bit of havoc in the in the whole abdomen, in the whole GI system. We, I do visceral work as well. So that is something that we always assess and, and really try to identify where those restrictions might be and trying to improve the mobility. For someone that's listening, that could be doing things like creating rotation, breathing into the motion, motion, breathing into that end rotation to try to influence the viscera and on all of the mobility and motility of the organs. Outside of that, one of the things that would be really important is still understanding why they had that to begin with, of course. And really, so that's more of a timeline, you know, when I'm meeting with someone and really trying to unpack their timeline, it's just trying to identify when did things start to change? Why did things start to change? And then, of course, they, they do need bile supplementation, which is not something that is ever recommended, quite frankly. Yeah. I, I never see that. And so, of course, the liver is still producing the bile, but the gallbladder isn't there to say, you know, hey, Amy's eating this much fat right now. Yeah. <laughs> so normally that just wreaks havoc on their system. And one of my patients who... It, I, it was a really cool vagus nerve case too. She was throw, She was waking up every morning, throwing up for 10 years. So she'd brush her teeth, she would throw up, she had her gallbladder removed. And there, it was a combination of things, but I did give her a specific vagus nerve exercise to reprogram the pharyngeal branch, the vagus nerve. And she did that, stopped throwing up. And then we were able to support her with bile and really just optimizing her nutrition and everything else. But it was a really interesting case because that is a perfect example. That's, yeah. that's so dysfunctional. People are not able to yeah. manage it without yeah. support. Yeah, it kind of gets taken out and, and that's that and they're they're yeah. off to the like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Check. Yeah, check. I'm like, nah, I don't I don't think it really works like that. I'm right. Pretty sure God gave that to you for a reason. So <laughs> might need to address why it's not there now. So the vagus nerve, can you just um uh, it's kind of like I don't know your niche. I feel like you you talk about this. You talk about you this talk bit, about it a lot. Uh, a lot. Maybe just explain where where it's at in the body and mm -hmm. uh what it's in charge of and why it's so important. Okay. So it is, think of it like our super highway between our gut and our brain. So that's fun in and of itself. And it is really 80% of our autonomic nervous system. So, or of our parasympathetic system. So think of our rest and digest ultimately. 
Most often in modern society, we could become extremely dysregulated because of the stressors we place on ourselves emotionally yeah. or even the foods that we're eating or lack of exercise, all the things that we're talking about. So a lot of times when people reach out to me about the vagus nerve, they say, something's wrong with my vagus nerve. You know, we need to fix it. But really, it's trying to figure out why are you having vagus nerve issues in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, it, it is exiting the brainstem and it has all of these branches. It's, it's called our wandering nerve. So it's a crani two cranial nerves that are coming down into the ear, into the throat, um, all the way down through the esophagus into the lung and then also into the entire digestive tract. So we actually have about 80% of the information coming from the viscera to the brain, which is really, that's one of the things that to me is the most fascinating because there's so many things we can do to influence the vagus nerve from here. So that's what we eat, or that can also be even just stimulating the viscera that manually as well. Give me some examples of how you would stimulate it manually. Yeah, so you can, so let's just say a really easy one would be something like an abdominal massage. So if you were just lying down before bed, I, always, I give my patients this a lot just to start because it's a great somatic practice that they can just start to get in tune with their nervous system. So you would just have hand over hand on the skin and just really, really gentle circular clockwise, like look from your angle clockwise um, motion. And, you know, doing that for one to two minutes or so, that should really downregulate the nervous system. It should create a nice response right before bed. But you can also do something like a sideline release. So you could put a ball or a towel under, you'd start on your left side. So just to, to help with digestion. So you'd place that and you just guide the skin, the muscle, the fascia, the organs kind of over the ball really gently. That's one of everyone's favorites. And then you'd switch over to the right side and do something like that. Um, you can also do lymph massage. So there's a lot of different techniques that you can use to get really address this whole area. Are those some of the same tech, techniques you're using to treat constipation? Because that's another big issue. People, people don't, it's not normal to poop every three days, you know, like you need to be going to the bathroom <laughs> yeah. every single day. Every. So I think I saw on your Instagram, you, you provided a video and I know you did some of that similar uh, movements, but maybe I think there was like mm -hmm. a, another two or three exercises that you had in there for your patients. Can you tell us what those are? Yeah. So you can do like for, for chronic constipation, you can do something called an I love you massage like you do with babies. And you can start at the, the colon. So on the left side, the sigmoid colon, and you're kind of in, kind of just manually manipulating that part gently. Yeah. Then you'd come up. So then you're kind of starting from a little bit higher in that like descending colon. Then you come across and then you do your U. So it's the I, then the L, and then okay. the U. So that's a really nice technique that's great to also do the same thing before bed. Sometimes I'll have people do both. I'll say, start with the I love you, then do the general abdominal massage. And then even something like a, a version of a happy baby to most people that have chronic constipation are going to have pel pelvic floor issues. So most people that have gut issues have pelvic floor issues. So we never want to ignore either one of those yeah. in, in either case. So something like a happy baby is really nice to emphasize opening the pelvic outlet and just breathing down into the pelvic floor to really relax the pelvic floor and then being able to reinforce those things with things like squatty potties and working on bowel mechanics as well. Um, I'm curious as we're, you know, getting close to wrapping up our podcast here, like what are your some, some of your non-negotiables in your life uh, for your own health? Because how many how many so years out lot. are you from your cancer? <laughs> how many years out are you? So nine years. I okay. just got my last congratulations. Ever, so that was, oh wow, thank congratulations. You. Yeah, thank you. So I have a lot of non negotiables, but I will just kind of give you the highlights: strength training, walking, eating well. I never will leave the house without bringing my food, yes. <laughs> water, and electrolytes. Meditation, nervous system lymph drainage <laughs> and and sleep yeah i'm pretty you're starting to sound so high this, maintenance you're so, sounding high maintenance. i know <laughs> that's exactly what my husband would say about it but those are my you know i think of those just your foundation yeah. <laughs> but for me those are the things that that help me to thrive and that's how i always look at it that i always want to feel great i don't want to feel just okay yeah. um electrolyte are you using a specific brand or what's your favorite there yeah, personally, I use Element. I yeah. love those. Same. They taste good. 
They yeah, taste so they're, good. They're my favorite. Yeah. They taste, like, they're so I, good. I love them. Like, I got one yes. right here. Uh, like, I'm like <laughs> I, I, I can't live without them. I can't believe I how much. I mean, I can drink. I don't know how big this thing is right here. 36, maybe. I mean, I, I can drink it. this okay. thing super quick. Like, with okay. with an element um, in there. And then we also put uh, uh, creatine in ours. Like, you know, okay. an element and a, and a creatine. Um and then what about a uh, sleep tracker? Are you using anything there? I don't use a sleep tracker. I do I do mouth tape every night. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I, I used to track for a long time. I used the whoop for, for years. And then I just kind of got out. Of, I, I just got out of tracking. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't get back into it. But just right now, I kind of feel like I have everything pretty dialed in. I know if I didn't sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> what mouth tape I'm, I'm are you using? In- I just use actually Next Care, okay. so I just do the sensitive skin, just one little strip here. I had my deviated septum repaired. I guess it was about six years ago, and so I do a lot with airway function with my patients and work really closely with a dentist who specializes in airway and sleep. So, so I just do a little 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 piece okay. here. <laughs> Breathing so important, it's, and it's very hard. I, I'm a, a trained Pilates instructor, and the breathing portion of that just certification was extremely difficult for me. I'm like, what is my problem? Like, just breathe. Like, take it, take a deep <laughs> breath. I'm serious. Like, it is hard for me. And I'm surely I'm not the only one. I'm like, why can't I just take big, deep breaths? So it might be that you do have an airway dysfunction. If you're, I would say most likely if you're feeling like it's that challenging, that's probably why. And that could look like something like a nasal obstruction that could mean you actually have a small airway that could mean jaw position narrow palate there's so many different aspects of airway so i that's been my evolution with breathing is that i realized early on in my career i was obsessed with breathing i would say it's your superpower but i didn't realize the impact of airway function and now that i understand that I, every patient I work with, I'm always screening them. I'm trying to figure out, do they have an airway or sleep disorder? And if so, then I'm, I'm kind of working with them to get that ironed out while we're doing everything else because sleep, sleep and breathing oh, trump everything. Yeah. I mean, you have to sleep <laughs> and there's a lot of people with that issue that we see too. They just don't sleep and they don't, mm-hmm. they don't realize, um, how big of a priority it actually, <laughs> it actually needs to be. Right. Um, what about podcast or books? Are you a podcast listener? Uh, and if so, yes. what, what are you listening to? So I love uh, Huberman. I love Peter Atia, Gabrielle Lyons. I, I always listen to, to educational yeah, things. Yeah. So a lot of audio books. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to maximize <laughs> so your time. That's how I feel. Yeah. I'm like I need my time <laughs> maximized. So, and I always pick things based on the, where I am at that time. What, do, what am I need? What am I learning about? And then I'll yeah. just dive in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Well, can you tell people your website and your Instagram? So where they can find you? Sure. So the website is the movement paradigm.com and that is also Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Oh, and you also have a book. Tell us what the name of your book is. I do. So it's called Rise Up and it is my personal journey of healing through mindset, nutrition and movement. Yes. Well, you have an, you can find that on Amazon. You have an incredible uh, story, incredible journey and um, love your mindset and people have, uh, can learn a lot from you. So I really appreciate you you being on the show today. I think we did our first Facebook Facebook live. I could not figure out how to pull it up to uh, see if there was (laughs) questions or not, but um, okay. Well, I, I can I, always hop on too if there was any questions. I think you were my first one. So uh, we'll, we'll see. So <laughs> I appreciate uh, your time today. Thank you for being on. All right. Thanks so much, Amy. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.